Uh, but now we will proceed with, uh, with our case, uh, Gary Halvin versus John Kitzhaber. Uh, Ms. Joyce. Thank you, and may it please the court and counsel. There are several different kinds of clemency and many more conditions that can attach to a particular grant of clemency. And perhaps the clearest formulation of the law in this area necessitates looking at the particular grant of clemency and the circumstances surrounding it. The clemency at issue in this case is a temporary reprieve of a death sentence that is untethered from any conditions. As a result, it's not the kind of grant of clemency that requires the individual to accept it in order for that clemency to be valid. There is no single case in Oregon or anywhere else in the country that we've been able to find that addresses the particular circumstances that arise in this case. That being said, the clemency power has stretched back for hundreds and hundreds of years, and Oregon's clemency power in all likelihood derives from that which originated in England. And that history actually does inform the question presented here. You started out saying there's several different kinds of clemency, some more traditional than others, but one of the things that's kind of noticeable in through the cases the parties discuss is some cases involve pardons, some involve commutations, some involve reprieves. Is there a difference among those kinds of acts of clemency that is important to the analysis? Recognizing that that's a yes no question, I think the answer is actually is maybe. And that's why I started from the premise that determining whether a particular clemency has to be accepted really necessitates looking at that clemency and in particular whether conditions are attached to it or what form that clemency comes in. So for instance, we have out of the US Supreme Court a case that's called Burdick that involves a pardon that was issued before the individual was convicted of a crime. I think it was actually even before he was charged with a crime. And in that context, the US Supreme Court said that because forcing an individual to accept a pardon in that circumstance would basically require the individual to admit his guilt to a crime, which in all likelihood run afoul of Fifth Amendment protections, that was something that the president couldn't force the individual to accept. There are also cases in a couple of, in Oregon, Houghton, and Dormanser that involved conditional forms of clemency. So one involved a conditional reprieve, another involved a conditional commutation. And it's long been accepted that where a grant of clemency comes connected with a particular set of conditions, the individual has to be said to accept those conditions and you can't force those conditions on them. But whereas here you have an unconditional grant of clemency, no court, as far as we can tell, has ever held that the individual who is receiving that clemency has the power, in essence, to exercise greater power than the executive officer who is issuing the clemency. One of the interesting things that's going on in these cases is what is executive and what is judicial. And one of the aspects of the I have to accept <coughs> argument is I have to raise this as a bar in the trial court. I have to bring in the uh, the document commuting or, or granting a brief reprieve and present it to the, the trial court. And yet the governor is the chief executive officer for the state and could simply direct the <coughs> superintendent not to proceed with the ex execution, couldn't he? Correct, and that's certainly our position in this case. And, and Chief Justice Palmer, I think what your question is hinting at is the Wilson case, which has obviously been discussed at length because of the rather broad language that it contains that has been carried over into other cases. But I think what's particularly important to keep in mind about Wilson is that it's really, in a way, a historical artifact. It's a case that was decided in 1833, and it really, at best, illustrates the limits that existed on courts' abilities to take judicial notice as those existed back in 1833. It may be a historical artifact, but it has remarkable longevity. It is recently, as 1957 in the Frederick's case, this court cited it, and it didn't cite the part about the conditional nature of the clemency. It simply cited the part about the fact that it, it, it needs to be accepted because it's kind of like the deed. Well, the most interesting thing about, or what's the most notable thing about Frederick's use of Wilson is that Frederick's didn't even involve the clemency power under Article 5, Section 14. So the discussion of that language in Wilson was at best sort of contrasting and making the point that what wasn't an issue was Article 5, Section 14. So I certainly think that Frederick's can't be read as, as, as I think Mr. Haugen would have it, as importing that standard. But you're right that Wilson has had remarkable longevity because it has that act of grace and favor language. 
But again, what's important to remember about Wilson is that the court in Wilson didn't purport to use the act of grace or favor language as the analytical framework for determining whether a grant of clemency is valid. It was simply describing, under the facts of that case, the way that the pardon was issued to this individual. And the, issue, and the individual, when he came before the court for sentencing, <coughs> opted not to tell the court about it. And the court at that time, and again, under apparently much older judicial notice restrictions, the court said, we aren't able to take notice of that. And, and the holding, which I actually have in front of me, and it's pretty short, so I'm going to read it, um, is that this court is of the opinion that the pardon in the proceedings not having been brought judicially before the court by plea motion or otherwise cannot be noticed by the judges. That's really the core holding of Wilson. And I'm not aware of any similar limits that exist today that would prevent, for instance, a court from taking judicial notice of something like the clemency that's been issued here. And, and it granted that the holding of Wilson may not be dispositive, and the references to Wilson and Wilson and the quotation from it are sort of to the side in many of this court's cases. Wilson purports to say this was the state of law in England, which was that a pardon or a reprieve was like a deed that had to be accepted. And you say, Justice Martin was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would say that. But, but I, again, I do think it's important to remember that the, that was decided under the facts that were presented in Wilson, and that it didn't purport to hold as a matter of law in all pardon or all clemency cases that every single pardon is an act of grace that is like a private deed that must be accepted to be valid. In that particular case, it was viewed that way because it was apparently delivered individually to the person, to the defendant who was the recipient of it. And because it was before his, sec his sentence had been imposed and carried out, the court determined that it wasn't within the power of the trial court to take judicial notice of it. But again, I think if the facts of Wilson were to arise today, we would likely end up with a very different result because I don't think there's anything that would prevent a court from taking judicial notice of a grant of clemency. I don't think there's anything that would prevent other parties to the case from bringing it to the court's attention. And the additional factor that we have distinguishing this case from Wilson is that we are well beyond a finding of guilt and an imposition of sentence. We are at the phase where uh, Mr. Havig has been committed to the Department of Corrections custody, and so it's the Department of Corrections who will be giving these grants of clemency and will be responsible for carrying them out. So it's an additional factor that really distinguishes Wilson. So if Wilson is distinguishable, what do we look to to determine whether the acceptance theory is a part of our constitutional doctrine? I think the easiest place to start is simply with the language of Article 5, Section 14, which certainly doesn't appear to import any kind of requirement that an individual has to, or even has the power or the ability to accept a grant of clemency. I think the acceptance theory and those, those two labels for those theories, the, the public welfare theory and the acceptance theories, those aren't theories that courts have announced as, again, as analytical frameworks to determine whether a grant of clemency has to be accepted. Instead, those are labels that mostly commentators and legal scholars have put on various U.S. Supreme Court decisions in particular, I think in an attempt to kind of reconcile them. But they're really not mutually exclusive. In some cases, it might fairly be said that a particular grant of clemency is a personal favor or it is an act of grace. But that's certainly not always the case, and we know that stretching, again, back into English times when sometimes the king could grant clemency for a particular reason or no reason whatsoever, or he could believe that the public welfare demanded that this individual uh, shouldn't serve out the sentence in the method in which it was imposed. So well, those along those lines, uh, does it uh, matter at all with respect to the state's position uh, what the governor's purpose or motive was? Uh, plaintiff and amicus make a lot of, uh, out of motive and purpose. Uh, what's the state's position? This court's uh, decision in, in debating how to pronounce this ECRET, I believe is how you pronounce it, versus Holmes, is really our, our response to that. And that is that because this is, the, the decision to grant clemency is something that is entrusted in the governor and the governor alone, no other branch of government is entitled to question or address the motives or the reasons or, or have really any 
any steps in which they asked that executive to come in and justify the reasons that he or she took that action. And he proposed so far as to suggest that this might not even be justiciable. Correct. Correct. You're not taking that position. You right. like that either that much. <laughs> I have this legitimate question as to whether we should just dismiss this case that there's no judicial controversy here. Correct. No, and, and I, I do think there is a line. And, and I think, Justice Baldwin, what you were getting at was if what Mr. Hagen was challenging, and in some respects is, and so I think he presents a complete answer to that, if what he's challenging is the reasons that Governor Kitzhaber issued the reprieve, that's not justiciable. Whether or not, as a threshold matter, an individual has to accept a grant of clemency for that grant of clemency to be valid is sort of a threshold legal question that doesn't require this court to, in essence, violate the separation of powers principles to determine whether the governor was entitled to act as he did. Is it your position that the, the Biddle case from, from 1927, the Supreme Court case that talks about the public welfare theory, is more consistent with the constitutional grant of clemency, pardon, reprieve authority? I think Biddle is the case that is the most closely similar to the facts that we have here, because again, that was a case that the clemency was issued, it was a commutation of a death sentence to life imprisonment. So it was issued after the sentence had been imposed and the individual was committed to the custody of the prison. But again, the, the two labels, the public welfare label and the acceptance label, I, they're not mutually exclusive. And so you might, in some cases, have a grant of clemency that's issued because the individual issuing it thinks that's what the public welfare demands. But in many cases, and we see this, I think, most often in presidential pardon cases, it's really a personal favor to the individual receiving the clemency, which is why, in all of these cases, I keep going back to, you have to look at the individual grant of clemency to determine whether it needs to be accepted to be valid. So whether it has conditions attached to it that the individual has to accept, or whether it requires the individual to admit guilt before he or she has been convicted of a crime. So the cases in which the defendant did accept are different from the ones in which the defendant did not, I would assume, because we can, whatever the theory is, there may be consequences for an acceptance that wouldn't necessarily relate to whether there would be a requirement of acceptance. And I, if I understand your question correctly, I, I think that's... I'm saying that the circumstances are, may be different, and I don't know what your position is on this. If, when the question comes up in the context of where a defendant has already accepted the benefits of the clemency, versus a situation in which the defendant doesn't want to accept them to begin with, and I think there are fewer cases in that latter category. Correct. There are many fewer cases in that category, and I think, really, the only case that I can think of off the top of my head is, is Biddle, because how this has come up, at least in the Oregon cases, so again, in Houghton and Dorrancer, have been, after the individual accepted the conditional reprieve, got out of prison, then failed to fulfill his part of the agreement, which was, in both cases, failing to follow the laws of the state of Oregon, and then was brought back in, and in that opportunity, or in those cases, they were challenging the, actually, the condition that was attached to it. So that's, I think, much more the kind of cases that we see that address this issue, because, quite frankly, I think, and this is what you keep hearing on the news, is that most people believe that an individual who has been granted a clemency from a death sentence would, in all likelihood, want to accept that, and there's actually language in Wilson that talks about the difference between a death sentence and a misdemeanor, and they say it's, it's almost implausible that any individual would, would choose to reject a death sentence. So I think that's why there's such a, a dearth of case law in this area. You described the governor's clemency authority broadly as very plenary. What is the significance of any of the legislative role that our Constitution sort of specifies? It, it sounds as though it may be kind of unusual to do that. What does that tell us about the nature of the governor's power? So Article 5, Section 14 does specifically talk about, subject to such regulations as may be provided by law, and there actually is a small subset of statutes that deal, and it's in ORS 144, 649, and the statutes that follow, and those do address situations in which an individual has asked for a grant of clemency, and it sort of dictates the process 
that has to follow upon an individual asking for clemency. So my sense from including that language that it's subject to such regulations as may be provided by law, that the framers of the Constitution thought that there may be some things that the legislature might enact that might affect the governor's what otherwise plenary powers, but to date the only ones that are on the books are really those ones that deal with situations in which the individuals ask for a grant of clemency. And I'm not sure, there, there are in many other states, the way that the clemency power is set up is that the executive has a clemency power, but there's sort of a, an advisory board or some kind of board that ultimately has to approve it. And in enacting our Article 5, Section 14, the Oregon Framers actually specifically rejected that kind of advisory board. So I don't know if this is a, a holdover or, or some kind of oversight that they wanted to include in this, because quite frankly, it's just not explained in the history of the, the framing of that provision. And there's this a full check of treason. Treason. Correct. Correct, right. If, if uh, upon conviction for treason, he can suspend the execution of the sentence until it's reported at the next, next legislative assembly. So the governor would simply uh, uh, direct the superintendent not to proceed with the execution without uh, acting under his clemency powers, the Greek powers? I think that in turn would create its own concerns in terms of separation of powers. And there's actually a case in Oregon, I think it's the Carpenter case that talks about, that was a case in which the, the court had actually paroled the individual. And the question was whether an executive agency could in essence override the judicial's decision to parole this individual. And, and what they said was that the executive really doesn't have the power to do that kind of thing. So given that the court in this, a court, a trial court, in this case, had issued a death warrant. I don't think that the governor could simply call up the Department of Corrections and say, don't carry that out. I think the only way in which he could do this, and, and Carpenter actually suggests as much, is for him to exercise his authority under Article 5, Section so, 14. So if the governor felt that the drugs used in the lethal injection process were, you know, allowed pain in the prisoner, that it's inappropriate to use those, and wanted to not have any executions for that reason until they figured out a different set of drugs to use. Uh, he would have to suspend or give a temporary reprieve at least to everybody on death row while that process worked out. At least people that had death warrants. Correct, as opposed to just directly contacting right. the Department of Corrections and, and taking that back. And that, I, that, I suppose, gets around, or right? you would argue that gets around Mr. Lado's reference to the provisions of the Constitution that say, governor has to execute the laws and he has to suspend laws and things like that. Correct. Nothing is being suspended here. I think the, the primary law that Mr. Hogan argues is being suspended is Article 1, Section 40, which provides for the death penalty in certain cases if, if certain factors are met. That provision is still fully in force and in effect. Juries who are faced with the determination of whether to impose a death sentence still have the ability to do that. All that is being reprieved for a temporary period of time in this case is the carrying out of a particular sentence. And in fact, Governor Kitzhaber is acting under the authority of laws on, by virtue of his powers under Article 5, Section 14. So it really can't be said that he's suspending the laws that he's acting under. One of the arguments that I think is amazing in the has been that really we shouldn't be trying to look back to English common law or any of that at all after all that was a key and that was very different organic structure of the government from what we're dealing with here. I think that you don't necessarily subscribe to that and you seem to still want to anchor yourself somewhat in British common law. I think and as this court has often noted, it, it can sometimes be difficult, particularly when there's not a lot of historical discussion around the enactment of a particular constitutional provision to divine the origins of it. I do think it can safely be said that the clemency power is very, very old. The United States Supreme Court has said that the clemency power that is enshrined in the United States Constitution certainly derives from that in England. And so I think it's fair to say that the idea of clemency as it existed in England, which is very similar to the way it exists in the US Constitution, is also reflected in Article 5, Section 14. I probably wouldn't go so far as to say everything about the clemency power as it existed in England has to be identical to that today, but I think a lot of the ideas behind the clemency power and the notion that 
the individual executive should have this power to in his or her <coughs> determination to decide that the, a person over whom they have the responsibility doesn't deserve to suffer a particular sentence. That's that's the whole idea behind clemency, and that I, I do think is enshrined within our constitution. Is it one of the other ideas that it is one of perhaps the two key checks and balances exercised by the executive and the branch system of government that's entirely different from England's and as a check and balance and you know, it informs differently how we how we look at the governor's prerogatives in exercising. And again, I, I think it's the same themes that you see that arose in England, and, and I think either Biddle or Burdick talks about this, that that it could be that a, a judge or a jury back in the English Times decided that there's a particular sentence is warranted, and yet as a check on sometimes perhaps um, improper evidence or some facts that come to light afterwards that might make the particular individual appear innocent, that, that one person has the ability to exercise his power, his clemency power, to decide that that person shouldn't carry the sentence out. So I, I think, again, the, there, and this is why I think the acceptance versus public welfare theories are, are a little dangerous to kind of categorically adopt one or the other, because there are so many different things that have played into the clemency power as it exists today, and that's, that's certainly one of them. And I get that. I'm not sure in England, though, I necessarily think it was a check and balance so much as it was a reflection it's good to be here. <laughs> and I, I definitely think that was the, the primary responsibility, but there is some discussion, and I can't remember if it's in Blackstone, but one of the old English commentaries that we rely upon that does discuss that there could be questionable evidence, and that that could be a basis for the king at that time to decide that this particular individual warranted a grant of clemency. Would you agree that if the um, governor puts conditions on a grant of clemency, that the I do with a, just a little caveat, and, and that is in the cases of capital punishment. It, it's hard for me to imagine as a practical matter that the governor would issue a conditional grant of clemency in a death sentence case that would then enable that person to reject it. But there has been, and again going back to English Times, this sort of idea that, that death penalty cases are different and that an individual doesn't possess the power to force his government to execute him if that isn't what the government wants to do. So I, I think as a, as a general matter, conditional grants of clemency. Uh, aren't there, aren't there case, aren't some of the English cases don't some of them say, I will, uh, won't, you won't be subject to the death penalty if you go to Australia and don't come back. And then they come back. Then they can be executed again or not. And I don't actually know that there were any cases along that line. There definitely were cases that were conditional in nature that involved this individual having to, to leave the territories and not being able to come back. And those were generally thought to be conditions that had to be accepted. And if the individual then failed to fulfill that condition, they could be called back into prison. But I'm not aware of any cases, and I think the English commentary is actually to the contrary, that you cannot force a government to execute you against your life. So, so you're saying even the conditional distinction may not have any claim when you're dealing with um, death penalty sentence? I definitely want to reserve that as an option. I think it's it's a much clearer, it's sort of a clash between two doctrines. Which is, it's just, it's sort of what, what Holmes says in, in the middle case. Supposing the Kirby's did not accept the change, he could not have gotten himself hanged against the executive order. Exactly. But not going to let him do that. Right. So that, and that's why I say if it's a conditional grant of clemency in a death sentence case and the individual attempts to reject it, that's why I'm comfortable saying categorically. But where does the right to reject come from? If, anyway, I mean, is it, is it, do we have to assume that it does exist at least up until this point? Yeah, absolutely. I think you can assume that it exists because we have a couple of cases in Oregon where there has been a specific condition. That's but regardless of what theory, they don't go by the theory, but let's say we say the, the theory is acting in the public interest and therefore the public is to control. Does that by its nature eliminate any right to reject? Or no, and, and that's why I say that the, the whatever label that is, is put on it isn't necessarily determinative of the analysis that you use. It doesn't purport to provide the analytical framework. It may in some cases 
describe the motivations that a grant of clemency is given, but neither of those theories provides the method by which you have to determine whether a grant of clemency has to be accepted. Well, what is the, am, am I correct in understanding you to say that if, the, if a person does have the power to reject a grant of clemency, it comes from the existence of the condition? Correct, exactly. And I see my red light is on. Thank you. You'll have your full five minutes to fill a bit of your run. Mr. Wadow. Good morning, may it please the court. It's nice to be back at my alma mater. Um, I think just, 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 just disability is probably a good place to begin because uh, that's the beginning of the beginning. And then the, uh, I think the parties roughly agree about that issue. Um, that is, uh, as to a governor's exercise of discretion, um, that cannot be questioned by the judicial branch. But uh, what constitutes a reprieve uh, is an issue that can be addressed by this court, because that's kind of a threshold uh, issue. If it's not really a, a reprieve at all, but something else, um, that's not an exercise of his discretion at all. Oh, but there's yet another issue, which is if it's a reprieve, it doesn't have to be accepted. To what degree is that a decisionable question? We might say if it's a decree, but that still leaves us with your argument. It, what, 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 the, what, the, what the essential aspects of, or attributes uh, of, of the reprieve are. Um, and if that's non judicial, uh, and there really is uh, a right of a prisoner to reject a reprieve or other form of clemency, then the governor could avoid that by simply stating in his um, pardon or reprieve that uh, I hereby declare that this reprieve has been accepted by the uh, And then that that uh, act would be non-reviewable. So we could easily uh, get around uh, judicial review that way. Mr. Well, suppose that the governor had commuted the sentence, commuted Mr. Howland's sentence to life in prison without possibility of parole. Would if Mr. Howland had to accept that? No, I don't think so. The, case, the cases of this court do not distinguish between the forms of clemency. Uh, conditional versus unconditional, that's an important issue that I'll discuss today. But uh, as to reprieve, uh, commutation, or pardon, uh, no distinction is drawn. And I'm confused. I would have thought your answer would be yes. Right. I'm sorry. I, 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 I would have thought your answer was, well, go ahead. The, the, the answer would be yes. Commutation of reprieve, it doesn't matter in the context of the Oh, yes, that's, that's what I meant to say. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, is a commutation uh, also subject to uh, the recipient's uh, acceptance? Yes. But, but you, you, you point that this point cases don't distinguish between conditional and unconditional grants of reprieves or clemency, but we, they don't seem to say very much at all about that. At least they seem to give glancing blows at the subject. Uh, well, some of them. What one might think. Uh, well, um, first of all, the Wilson case, it's indisputable that Wilson was an unconditional part. Um, the court discusses uh, conditional versus unconditional pardons a little bit in its opinion, but that's only to, to show that um, because clemency takes many forms, it has uh, different conditions and things, that it has to be expounded by the court as the, as the way the court put it there before it can be effective. What do you view the issue? to be resolved by the court of Wilson to that point. What precise issue was it? Well, um, I don't see the pleading issue and the acceptance issue as essentially different. But what um, was the issue? The issue was whether uh, the pardon um, could be rejected by the intended recipient. Well, and the answer was, was yes. Do you think that was the issue in Wilson? Yes, and, and there's a lot of discussion about it pleading, of course, and judicial notice, so it could be construed as more of an evidentiary or pleading issue. But I think um, there's just as much language indicating that it's uh, that the recipient's right to reject uh, as a, in the nature of the, of the act. Uh, and plus, um, any, any litigant is, is the master of this case. So people, uh, litigants don't plead things uh, if they don't want to. They're not forced to plead things. So that's why I don't think it's it's essentially different, uh, the pleading issue from the acceptance or rejection. I can see that one might 
have some play in the other, but one way to read Wilson for Chaos is essentially that in the, because it was a private act and not a pardon from Parliament that would have been noticed in the court without pleading, it had to be pled in order for the court to notice that and without having any pleading before it, the court couldn't take any cognizance of one. Now, I, granted, I thought that the court said in saying it was a private act, it, noted it was like a deed and had to be accepted. But ultimately, more precise at least one way of doing it, is that the absence of the pleading meant the court couldn't take cognizance of it and therefore couldn't consider it in determining the, whether, whether, or not, whether or not the crime for which Mr. Wilson had pled guilty was part of the crime that the government had pardoned. If I understand correctly, there were two separate crimes, and one of the issues was whether one was subsumed in the other. Correct. Um, lesser included in today's yeah. terminology. Um, what is pleading, though? Pleading, <laughs> pleading <laughs> means this is look, a look. Class. <laughs> <laughs> pleading means uh, look, uh, Your Honor. I have a pardon, and I am asserting it. That's what a, that, any pleading is something uh, alleged in court by the litigant. Uh, and if he doesn't plead it, he doesn't plead it. So it, it's, it's not essentially different. Pleading and uh, judicial notice and acceptance are all the same kind of ball of wax thing. And here, you know, part of your position is Mr. Howden does not want to come in and you know, raise the uh, decree as a law court, right? That, that's, that's part of the point. Correct. And he has not done plead this. I, you know, it's not. It's in effect. Correct. Uh, and yet, uh, we have a public document issued by the governor that you know, was titled whatever it's titled, and reports to uh, to grant this decree. It can certainly the court can take judicial notice of uh, this official act by the governor, attested to by the Secretary of State. Probably. I, I don't see uh, that the court has to uh, blind itself to things like that. But, uh, but again, um, that's, I don't think that's a reasonable construction of what Wilson says. Uh, the, the more reasonable interpretation of the case is that it's within the recipient's control whether he pleads it or whether he accepts it is essentially the same thing. So, so can you cite us a, a case the state says no such case exists. Is there any case in American jurisprudence, or maybe even English jurisprudence, in which a governor reported to reprieve somebody from a death sentence? That's all the governor is doing, or a condition, or express condition added to it, and uh, the court ordered the prisoner executed. I haven't found a case like that, Your Honor, and obviously it's an unusual situation, so. Uh, I, I wouldn't expect to, to find a case like that. It's, it's, how, how about any other case, maybe not involving a death sentence, but still <laughs> some kind of sentence that uh, an executive, that would be an executive branch of government, um, purports to reduce to a lesser sentence, and the prisoner refuses it, and the court says the prisoner can't do uh, um, I don't think I'm aware of a case like that, but there are four decisions of this court. Um, over a long period of time, uh, adopting the uh, acceptance theory of pardons. Well, and I know that's true, but the point of that is it, it keeps arising in cases where that's not the issue. And so the fact that the courts may have sort of talked and invoked sometimes this broad principle that it's never the issue in the case and gets applied to it, except maybe in the middle in the U.S. Supreme Court, where well, we're, 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 it arises, but it's a clear conditional a, a exception. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, Biddle, I, I should just note that um, the uh, habeas petitioner in Biddle sought his discharge from custody because he was in federal custody at the time, although he was convicted in Alaska before it was a state and it was under some kind of territorial jurisdiction. And the trial court uh, in that case uh, applying the acceptance theory said the prisoner is discharged from custody. That means he was free to, to leave. Uh, and maybe Alaska could catch up with him and maybe, maybe not. So that's the holding, that's the result of the Supreme Court that I think did not want to occur. Um, but didn't the court essentially hold that the, uh, the, the public welfare is going to be presumed uh, just based on the 
proper exercise of authority. Yes. And, and um, <coughs> anybody can say Justice Marshall was wrong, it would be Justice Holmes in that case. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I think it's, it's no more than a truism, really, to say that a pardon or a reprieve or a commutation serves a public purpose. That, that's the nature of our of, of clemency. Uh, and that's why it's in our Constitution and why it's in the federal Constitution, because we have considered that there should be an out from justice that, uh, that seems to be an error or seems to be too cruel or when a sentence is uh, deemed to be uh, too severe. Well, so, it's, more, it's, it's more than truly as a mess, but ultimately uh, it determines whether or not the convicted uh, murderer makes the decision or the decision of the governor or the president is uh, given effect. Well, uh, I would just answer, Your Honor, that this court has implicitly rejected the uh, public welfare uh, conception of a, of a pardon or a commutation in the more recent case of Fredericks. Because that case was decided in the 50s, I think, long after uh, the Biddle case. What was the issue with Fredericks? And what did the court's discussion of Carpenter have to do with the issue? Um, the issue in Biddle was, uh, had to do with good time credits in the California. Fred Fredericks. Fred I'm yeah. sorry, Fredericks. Um, a prisoner was uh, mistakenly released from prison because his good time credits were erroneously calculated. Um, and um, the, the state maintains that uh, the, state, the statement in that Frederick's case uh, about acceptance is dictum. And uh, it is a dictum because it was an essential part of the court's reasoning. Um, this court, it was a split decision, and, and this court was answering the dissenting justices uh, argument when it cited uh, Wilson and Carpenter. Um, and the dissenting justice's argument was that uh, the clemency power of the governor is what he called a complete power, uh, such that it could not be infringed upon by another branch, uh, and it could not, um, there could not be overlapping uh, powers that would infringe upon uh, the pardon power to that extent. So the way um, this court uh, responded to that argument was that, well, no, the pardon power is not a complete power. It's not all that complete. And the reason it's not complete or absolute is because it's subject to the recipient's uh, power to reject it. So a as an essential part of the court's reasoning, it was not dictated. Um, now, did, was this court In not? In that situation, the defendant had not uh, there was no pardon or actual act of cleansing in that case. Well, the, the good work, the defendant um, had been released and had, and had not rejected the release. Right, he was gleefully accepted the release. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the question in Frederick's was whether the governor was acting pursuant to the statutory authority of the good time statute under his constitutional authority. Kind of, yeah. I think so, yes. Um, but, but, the, but the complete power was what, what I think the court was uh, responding to a, uh, an argument that cast it as a constitutional power and said, the dissenting judges said, this is a constitutional power of the governor uh, and it's complete, it can't be infringed upon or, 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 or uh, we can't have overlapping powers. Overlapping was the term this court used. That's what makes it is arguably somewhat collateral to the principal reason in the case. If it's set that way, in the case, the court could have decided the case without ever remarking on it. Yeah, it could have, but it did. And um, I think the reason the court, this court was intent on answering every possible uh, argument was that it, uh, it was, uh, this court reversed itself on a petition for rehearing. So what became, what was the majority opinion became the dissenting opinion, and, the, and, the, and this court answered every single question. So, so as part of the court's reasoning, it, it, I don't call that dictum. I call it dictum uh, extraneous uh, or advisory. I mean, what is wrong? In other words, the fact that the defendant has the power, if, if, even if the defendant has the power to reject, doesn't necessarily mean another entity has the power to overlap. So you kind of wonder whether the majority, the, the reconstituted majority, preference on rehearing, actually got the issue right. At least a question. It's certainly a question. Of course, this court can uh, overrule <coughs> its presence. 
should it overrule these long-standing precedents? Uh, no. Uh, the uh, governor has not offered reasons sufficient for this court to do that. And, okay. and How about starting with the text of the provision, which doesn't give the prisoner a right to be punished? It seems to me that your position sort of transforms it into a permanent right on the part of the prisoner to be punished. Well, certainly there's nothing in the text that, that gives that right. Um, as construed originally by the U.S. Supreme Court and then by this court, yes, it does have that right. But if, even if you go to the text, the word grant, I think, may suggest uh, that it's like a deed. I grant you something, and it's something you, you accept, uh, like a gift. Uh, a gift is only uh, effective if it's accepted, because the uh, uh, intended recipient might not consider it to be such a great gift. They might not want it. The grant is also coupled up with the power, which sounds fairly significant. Has power. power. It's a power, definitely. And it's, it's plenary power, I agree, in that the, the governor's discretion as to selecting a deserving recipient of clemency cannot be questioned. So it is a broad uh, grant of power, certainly. But it isn't your position here that the, the, governor, uh, the governor's act uh, lacked authority in the first instance because of his motive and purpose? Uh, I wouldn't put it exactly that way. Um, and I'd like to move on to uh, the, the second claim that um, Mr. Haugen has asserted, which I think is really independent of the acceptance theory. And the claim is that um, despite its label, this is not really a, a reprieve. Because the term reprieve had a fairly precise meaning at the time the Oregon Constitution was adopted and at the time the United States Constitution was adopted. And this is simply not a reprieve. Um, and the only reason I go into um, uh, Governor Kitzhaber's reasons for the reprieve, which he publicly declared, is to show that this reprieve is not directed as a typical act of clemency towards the prisoner as a deserving uh, recipient. But it's clear from his public statement, which I don't think this court has to plug its ears to, that his reason for granting it was that the laws were not working properly. If you get into the governor's <coughs> reasons for exercising that constitutional authority, doesn't that uh, run afoul of what this court said in Egret about justiciability? No, I don't, I don't think it does, because I don't think that's a matter of discretion, Your Honor, in, in discretion in the realm of determining who is deserving of clemency. So, this, <coughs> so your position is governor's reasons always have to be individualized? Uh, yes, that, that, that's partly in the nature of, of any act of clemency, but reprieve is a very specific type of clemency, which I'll discuss, and I think um, it's significant. Well, it's the, it is the problem with the reprieve that, uh, as you talk about it in some length in your brief, there's no end date on it, no specific date, yes. although, or, or is it that uh, you can't reprieve for this reason? Oh, well, well, both, and they're connected, I think, Your Honor. The, this court in the Finch case. Well, well, well in, in terms of the, of the first uh, point that you were making uh, <coughs> with uh, Justice Paul and Justice Landau, uh, isn't, I mean, this is the only uh, individual who had an outstanding death warrant about to be executed. So it does relate just to this individual. That's why you argued or why you ran the yes. just to this individual. And presumably, if another individual ended up in the same spot, he would grant them a little brief too. He, he's already right. declared that so, so, it's, it's, uh, so it is individualized circumstances, even though, as his statement suggests, at the time, as the document itself suggests, it is for broader reasons of public policy from his perspective. It, it get, I think, Your Honor, it gets back to um, the definition of uh, clemency as an act of grace or favor. It's, and, and that's how this court has referred to it uh, on repeated occasions, I think. Um, an act of grace or favor. Uh, is not something that can be forced on, on somebody. It's, it's essentially contradictory to, to hold that. That's, 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 that's your acceptance argument. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, they're, they're connected. They are, they are connected because um, uh, it, it's really, yes, those are particular circumstances. But uh, as Your Honor uh, points out, the next person who comes along with those particular circumstances is going to be reprieved 
also. Um, so it's a general, it's, a, it's, a, it's more general than it is particular. And, um, and that's a legal defect. I'm just trying to get to the precise yeah. defect, whether it's a lack of a precise date and because it doesn't have enough to do with this particular the, facts and circumstances. Thank you, uh, Your the, the, uh, the expiration date confirms the essential purpose of a reprieve. And that essential purpose is uh, described in the Fitch case, about 100 years old, but uh, I think it's still good law. And that, and, and because, um, because it goes back well into English history, and if you consult the older authorities, such as Blackstone, um, that is the essential nature of a republic of Creed also. Uh, this court cited some other text, Chitty, in the Finch case, but it, it's, it's consistent all the way along, and it's uh, the nature of a reprieve is to allow certain circumstances that would make the immediate execution of a prisoner inhumane or unjust to pass by. So your argument is not that this this exercise of the governor's authority is defective because it failed to have a particular date on it. I mean, the governor said until the expiration of his term, he could very well have said January, whatever it is, 19, I mean, uh, and whatever the date is, right? But yes. So, so your true. point is that the fact that it, that it ends at this term, it's not because it's not definite, it's because that shows that the reason for the exercise of that authority doesn't have to do with the usual reasons for yes. Do I have that right? Yes, I think that's well put, Your Honor. Um, it shows that, yeah, it shows that it's something else than a reprieve. And, and there were certain reasons for reprieves. The reasons have been um, to enable uh, a person condemned to death to, to, to do something. Because in uh, traditionally, under English law, a person condemned to death for uh, any felony, which, which made it a capital, uh, potentially a capital crime, had to be executed not the next day after sentencing, but the day after that. That was by English law. So. Um, the prisoner could not then pursue a pardon. Uh, he could not pursue, at times, an appeal. And even under more modern law, under Oregon law that I've described in the brief, um, there was a time where judges lacked, uh, trial judges lacked authority to uh, issue stays of judgment so that a condemned prisoner could pursue an appeal. So are you saying that's the only purpose that the governor can use the for? Not time for an appeal, but to allow certain circumstances uh, that exist that would make his immediate execution inhumane or unjust. Right, so circumstances such as allowing the public to consider whether this is humane or unjust given the current circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, I disagree, Your Honor, because those aren't the kind of circumstances that are going to um, pass by with a certain passage of time. Well, what, about, what, about, what about certain well, they, they are, or they, they, they might or might they, not? They might or might not. This reprieve, by its nature, could end tomorrow. Well, a person might or might not pursue an appeal all the way through. That's, that's true, and, and the governor in that case could issue uh, a renewed uh, reprieve to allow that to finish. But in the, what authority do you have to look behind the governor's act to ask about his motive? And then uh, I thought, I mean, why is that, are, aren't we sort of violating separation of powers by, by inquiring into why he was taking a particular act? It, uh, it's a difficult <coughs> question, I agree, Your Honor, but if, if, the, um, if what uh, the court is investigating is his exercise of dis discretion in determining uh, whether a certain person is deserving of traditional uh, clemency, but that would mean you would get to go in and assess whether it's traditional, non-traditional, whether he was acting for the correct reason or wrong reason. Not is that that seems a little troubling to me. This court still has authority to decide whether this is in fact what the governor says it is. If it's not a reprieve, if it's something masquerading as a reprieve, I think the, the, this court doesn't have to plug its ears to what the governor has officially declared to be his reason for the reprieve. He made it absolutely clear. It's true, but you're folding it off a lot into your definition of reprieve. You're, you're folding in the motivations of the governor to give it. And instead of asking what are the legal consequences to the prisoner's sentence, which I think is perhaps the 
concrete touch them, like whether this is a whole group or not. You're, you're now expanding the definition to say, well, it can have these consequences under the sentence, but still I'm going to agree that the government had, takes those steps for particular reasons. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding you. Well, you're, you're yeah. folding motive into the definition of motive. I guess in a way, I, in, in a way motive is relevant. But uh, Governor Fitzhauber made his reason for the revamp for his moratorium absolutely clear. He wasn't embarrassed by it or anything. He didn't want to hide it. He said, the laws are broken. And not only are the laws broken, uh, but uh, this particular law, which calls for a death sentence, uh, does not bring justice in his words. Um, so all of his reasoning uh, is directed at the laws. Um, and those laws under the um, uh, suspension clause and under the take care clause are, are not, they don't belong to the government. They belong to uh, the people of the legislative assembly. And, and, and the, the way to reconcile those clauses, that is the clause that says the governor uh, that only the legislative assembly has the power to suspend operation of the laws and the uh, clause that puts an affirmative obligation on the governor to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. I think the only way to uh, reconcile those provisions with what the governor has done is to, to take cognizance, cognizance of the fact that the governor, um, by his own declaration, is, is aiming his reprieve at the laws and not at this individual. He, and uh, he says the law the law. Well, it ends up being aimed at both as a, as a, as a practical matter. As, as a collateral consequence, Mr. Haugen is reprieved. But, but he doesn't care about Mr. Haugen. It's, the, the, the reprieve is not for Mr. Haugen's purposes whatsoever. Well, this is getting way into his mind in a way that, that seems to be is sort of inappropriate and, and impossible. It, it gets uh, and because it's certainly, if you have a the, the moral view of the world that he takes here. He does care about Mr. Howard at some level. Not him personally, but the, a person in his circumstances. Well, is that that's, that's absolutely Mr. true. But, but the, the Constitution trumps his, his moral views. Because the Constitution um, has a clause in it that says the death penalty is legal. Um, so that's the higher law that the governor has, uh, must obey, as we all must obey. Higher than the governor's Howard Yes. Um, because this is not a reprieve. Because he's, he's well, taking, I know, but he's taking action that he does not have the power to take um, by suspending the operation of certain laws that he doesn't like or that he thinks are not being implemented or administered properly. And he's saying these laws have to go on hold now while the voters of, of uh, Oregon uh, decide whether uh, we are going to abolish those laws. That's the announced uh, purpose of this reprieve. So I don't know why that, that, it, that it interferes with uh, uh, his discretionary authority for this court to say, okay, look, we hear you. Um, the, the, the other reasons uh, for reprieve, like you just mentioned, traditionally are one is, one is when a woman who was pregnant was then to die. Um, a reprieve was issued so that she could give birth and then be executed. The, one of the essential features of a reprieve uh, always has been that it does not annul the sentence. It allows the sentence to be carried out, but in what was considered to be, or is considered to be, a humane way. It's not humane to execute a pregnant woman, so she's allowed to give birth and then be executed. And I think it's indisputable through the centuries that a reprieve was never intended uh, or never was had the effect of annulling the sentence, but only to, to delay its carrying out. Uh, I'd like to look, consult my notes for one minute here. Uh, and, and Justice Landau, was, I think you're absolutely correct uh, that the expiration date only confirms that, that uh, aspect of the reprieve. And uh, finally, I would just like to uh, note historical practice in the granting of reprieves. Because there's a law in the books uh, enacted by the very first legislature, I believe, that requires the governor to report to the legislature regarding uh, every act of clemency, there's a very good historical record as to 
parties with previous communications through the years, and I've uh, examined those records closely and concluded there have been 120 reprieves since statehood, and every one of them until now has included an expiration date. So that's not a bizarre coincidence. It's reflective of the understood nature of the public. But whether it relates to the individual or to some larger, uh, certainly some of Governor West's reprieves <laughs> were related to larger uh, concerns about the appropriateness of the death penalty. They, they certainly were. The governor West's reprieves had an expiration date, which right. was a, a so day they, after. This one does too. It's just not written in. Uh, the, you, know, you could have, as Justice Mayo suggested, he could have put it in a date, either the end of his, his term, his current term, or if he runs for re-election and is successful in well, the second term. So I, 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 I take your point that the 120 reprieves all had expiration dates. I'm not, and, I, and that is one argument. I'm not sure that it uh, supports, at least some of them don't support the idea that that demonstrates that this reprieve is for some other purpose related to the laws and not the individuals uh, that uh, other people suggest in the laws. But I'll think about it further. Maybe I'll come around to that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Joyce. You have questions? Thank you. Just a couple of points. Uh, in response to Mr. Hogan's suggestion that the governor hasn't presented adequate reasons for overruling any case law, that's simply because there have been no cases in Oregon, as I mentioned earlier, that have decided the particular issue presented here. So in essence, this court is writing on a clean slate that doesn't need to overrule anything. The fact that the governor also provided somewhat lengthy explanations about the reasons or the motivations for the particular reprieve that he issued in this case doesn't mean that that opens the floodgates for individuals to challenge the basis for the reprieves. The fact that he explained it was simply his attempt to explain why he was doing it, but it doesn't mean that that subjects Governor Kitzhaber to having to justify or explain or defend the reasons. Do you think that we could, in a case, go decide based on what the governor said that this did not give the definition of an intrigue? And at some point, can a court look at whether what the act that has occurred fits within the constitutional definition? I think that's probably true because I think that's something that wouldn't require you necessarily to look at the motivations or the reasons for granting or approval. And that's really the danger that Acre and the political question doctrine really seek to protect against. So if you can look at the face of something that's entitled a reprieve and determine, and it's hard for me to envision what on the face of a reprieve would make it questionable, but assuming that that's. It may not have, it may not actually suspend the sentence. And if you can if you can make that determination by looking at the face of the reprieve, then in, in all likelihood that would be permissible. But again, what's not permissible is really going behind the face of an individual reprieve and questioning or forcing the individual who is who's issuing the reprieve to justify his or her reasons or motivations for doing so. And I just want to touch briefly upon the significance or the import of what it would mean if Mr. Haugen were right. And that would mean that Mr. Haugen, in essence, has or possesses or believes he possesses powers that are equal or, in fact, greater than those that the governor has that are enshrined in the Constitution in Article 5, Section 14, and that he, in essence, can override the governor's constitutional authority to issue clemency. I would suggest that that is... Uh, well, he, but his, his point is, Mr. Lado's point would be, wait a minute, we have the voters who approved the death penalty, we have statutes, some of which the voters passed, some of which the legislature has passed, uh, regarding how death penalty cases are supposed to proceed. And uh, he, Mr. Uh, Haugen was duly convicted, his appeal was affirmed, and the death warrant was issued. So it's not, uh, it's not like there's no constitutional basis for what's happening here, right? I mean, he, 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 Mr. Howard said, this is my choice, this is the jury's choice, this is the Supreme Court's choice. Right, but all of that was done in the context and, and underneath our constitutional framework, which also provides the governor with the unique and singular ability to grant clemency in cases where he or she sees fit, and that's exactly what happened in this case. 
And I see that I'm almost out of time, so I would just ask that this court reverse and remand for entry of the declaratory judgment that the reprieve is issued by Governor Kitzhaber is in fact valid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grace. Thank you, counsel, for the, the briefs uh, and arguments today. I uh, appreciate the, the help and the thoughtfulness of the Eric.